So that's great. I mean, gr great, great insights about what is happening on the consumer side. But I think right now is the time to really start to connect the dots. What is really happening on the, on, on the demand side? What implications that is happening on the supply side? So today we have a, a great panel with us. We have a high caliber analyst here. We have Roland Fumasi, a true expert in the fruits and vegetables supply sector. And then we also, then we have a Don Close, a true icon on the US and beef cattle sector. Then we have Sterling Liddell, our glo global data strategist, who also has a great experience on the farm econ side. And then we have a, a, a true recogni truly recognized banker, Don Melzer, our uh, global head of m and So this is great. And then I don't want to take much time. I really want to uh, uh, pass it over to you, Roland. So what is happening on, on the fruits and vegetables side? So when you think about some of these consumer trends that my colleagues talked about earlier, certainly the, one of the first ones that comes to mind that's impacting the fruit and vegetable space is convenience. Um, and we say it's queen because uh, taste is still, taste is always king. But I, I want to start and show you that over the last five years, general fruit and vegetable consumption in this country has gone up about a respectable 15, 16%. But these numbers can be dangerous, to say the least. You really have to look under the hood at some specific categories, sometimes very specific categories of fruits and vegetables, and, and sometimes more, more generally. So this, one of the general important trends uh, is convenience and what that means in this space. Right. When you look at the growth over the last five years in value-added fruits and vegetables, it completely eclipses the general growth rates that you see on your left-hand side. Okay. So value-added fruits and vegetables is key, and it's important to remember that it's not just about value-added when it comes to convenience. We have to remember that some types of fruits and vegetables are just naturally more convenient. Right? They're, they just grow, they're bite-sized, they're, bite they're less messy, they're, they require less preparation. Right? So that's part of the convenience uh, trend, uh, or the importance of convenience as well. Uh, but even when you look at these impressive growth rates in value-added fruits and vegetables, there's still something that's even more impressive than that. And that's when you look at the trend of healthfulness and how that's impacted the demand for organic fruits and vegetables, right? High double-digit growth rates in the U.S. spend for organic fruits and vegetables. Extremely impressive. In the organic space, what began as a, a consumer-driven trend years ago has really become more than that now. It's as much driven by retailer demand for wanting to put more organic products on the shelf. It's a higher margin product. And that's one of the reasons I think this organic fruit and vegetable trend has some short, medium, and long-term legs underneath it. So when you combine all these numbers and you kind of net everything out, it leaves us with, uh, with a couple of strategic implications for many of the people in this room uh, who are in this space. And the first, the first takeaway is that these trends require greater amounts of collaboration than ever before, right? And the reason that they, one of the reasons they require greater collaboration is because of my second takeaway, and that is that your product mixes should almost be in a constant state of flux. Certain types of produce, uh, product, specific commodities in this space probably need to gradually be on the decline on the supply side, while you're ramping up other ones, because it's all about specificity. It's not good enough to just be in the citrus space or in the table grape space, because global demand for table grapes is growing. It's all about having the right cultivars, and it's all about having the right mix, right, of conventional and organic production, because that's what retailers and the consumers demand today. So collaboration and specificity in how you define your strategies 
in the produce space are key. So let's pass it over to uh, Don Close. And what, so what is happening? Given these consumer trends, Don, is that really affecting the animal protein sector? Yes. I don't know that if we're looking at it of how much it has changed the animal protein space to date, uh, but we're looking at the, the growth of, of the slide that Paula showed early on and the inevitable fact that uh, grocery shopping will be coming online. And, and when that occurs, what are the ramifications to the red meat industry or, or total protein industry? Um, so we've looked at it, and because of all the attention in the last 18 months or two years, uh, we, we're taking a look at the, at the meal kit side of it, and uh, we're also looking at uh, grocery shopping online. And I, it took a lot of, of thinking about it to determine that uh, meal kits are really only a subset of the whole e-commerce thing and, and think about it that way. There's so, that, that space is so fluid right now. We, we've discovered 170 companies that are in the meal kit business. And of that, um, I don't know that any are profitable. I also, as I've talked with industry folks, think that uh, the, the meal kit space will probably be won by the conventional retail grocery store. Um, so the real thing we, we look around at on the meal kits is when you look at all these different companies, they've all got all the sustainability, healthy, uh, some are organic, but they've got all the buzzwords, but the real price differentiator between them is price per plate. And of the research we've done, I've found a low price point of $5 a plate. I've, find, I've found a high price point of $18 to $20 a plate. But the middle ground of that's $9 to $12 a plate. And if you look, okay, so what, what proteins are the most likely to succeed in that environment? And if you take anybody that's been on a household budget, that the first thing you do is cut down the size of the portion of the protein in the center of the plate. If that doesn't get you to where you need to be, you start going to alternative proteins to get there. Um, as a result of that, we think that the meal kits are ideally positioned for the broiler industry. We think the pork complex is very well positioned, but there's concerns that the beef complex uh, could be priced out of that $9 to $12 a plate. So if these things are highly successful, um, it could be detrimental to per capita consumption of beef overall. Now, to the broader space of, of e-commerce. I think just the, the opposite is true when we, we go to that, that space. And what we're seeing is incredible opportunity. Um, and, and if you take a conventional grocery store, and I've simply gone and looked at the, the populations by zip code and looked at the number of conventional grocery stores inside that zip code to find out how many consumers does it take to support a conventional grocery store. And I come up with a number of eight to 9,000. So of that eight to 9,000 consumers, you come to actually about 4,000 consumers. And in a conventional grocery store, we have the majority of that fresh meat case is um, the bottom end of choice on the beef side. We've got a little bit of select product for the value shopper, and depending upon the neighborhood, you'll have uh, a varying degree of branded products, quality and ultra high quality products. And with that population number and that product stream, we can keep inventories clear. Now we take and explode the size of that pie. Um, E-commerce will provide the opportunity to provide product to all of the niche consumers. And if that's a product, a consumer that's looking exclusively for breed specific products, if they're looking for you know, uh, whatever uh, quality grade differentiation, if they're looking for a natural product, uh, the, the anti antibiotic crowd, uh, NHTCs or, or no implants, even to organics. So, we'll have the opportunity to service each of these niche customer groups. The, 
the real difficulty in that environment is for the conventional meat processing industry. And our U.S. industry, specifically and particularly on the, on the beef and pork side, but we've got large plants that are set up to, there is no off switch. You know, they, they want to open up and they want to go. Um, if we go to all these niche products, it is going to force them to have lots of starts and stops to operations for product segregation. It will force them to have many more SKUs in inventory that will be a, a, a storage and, and record keeping burden for them. Um, so that's going to be the pushback. The, the last point of this thing is for the number of small producers and small specialty producers that are looking to enter the marketplace, I think this could be a really good opportunity because it provides them to meet a market niche that they couldn't provide from a, yeah. from a local brick and mortar store. And I was gonna ask you that, you know, during the Q&A session because I was, I was I, I've been kinda intrigued about that. Uh, and, but I, I think it's incredible to really understand that, you know, for example, these consumer changes that sometimes are as a result of what is happening on Facebook could also even have some implications on the GNO side. I mean, what is, for example, what is, what is happening on that, on that space, uh, Sterling? Well, f first of all, um, Pablo, I appreciate the introduction. I noticed that everybody up here was a true something except for me, which I'll tell you what I am. I'm a true odd duck, especially on this panel, because I'm representing something that we're not normally looking at, which is, which is data and the analytics behind where we're going in the future. Um, as we look at where quality is right now and what the differentiating points that we have had in the past for what quality is, those traditional po uh, value points or points of quality, qual the price, the packaging, et cetera, those still exist. But the one thing that's changing pretty dramatically is the values-based type of quality. And we, we all know that as you think about your own supply chain. The problem is that's getting bigger. And it's the most unpredictable of all of these points on here from a differentiation perspective. So looking at the equation for making a decision on, on purchasing has changed. And I took away some key things from the last couple of days, and really the key things, four things specifically, and I wrote them down in my book, but I wrote them here as well. Resilience, agility, optionality, as well as uh, day trading uh, attention span. So remember that, day trading attention span. So how does this new paradigm affect our um, supply chain? I have to see things pretty simply. So this is a very simple supply chain, but I would encourage you to look, think about your own supply chain. What is happening in the supply chain? Well, historically, we generally put those points of differentiation up at the front, or at, sorry, at the very end of the supply chain where we start looking at packaging and how we're going to price and how we're going to put the product out. These new points of differentiation can be driven all the way through the supply chain. And that's going to have several effects, including what's happening at the farm level, where currently farmers are not making a lot of money for what they're producing. They're looking for those margins. And the, the main impact is effectively an adaptation of the supply chain. And we think about what that means. What sector is that going to affect the most? Think about your own supply chains. As we look at this, especially in the traditional sense, um, looking at farming coming the, down the channel, the sector that be, goes under the most pressure becomes that center wholesale or merchandising uh, sector. It actually, in some effects, becomes under attack by the farmers moving forward and the producers moving backward. The key variables then become product attributes, logistics, the ability to move grain from one place to another or product from one, to a, one place to another, and that becomes the real critical factor that reorganizes this supply chain and thinking about it from, again, from a bimodal distribution, 
is really effective because no longer is the historic chain always going to work or the historic channel, especially if you're in those traditional uh, positions where the wholesale uh, and merchandising uh, industries have already always operated. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's, let's move it to, to uh, Don Melzer, uh, our global head of M&A, and, and ask him, so given, given these consumer trends, I mean, how important is for companies to start like being, for example, being more vertically integrated, for example, to, with the farm gate? Well, first of all, uh, Pablo uh, and my colleagues, and, and frankly, the previous panel, uh, what we're describing is, uh, is truly a historic transformation over really the past five years in, in the entire food industry. Uh, and the big picture is that instead of our industry working from a push point of view, it's now working from a pull point of view. Uh, with customers and consumers demanding variation that basically our supply chain is not, was not originally uh, set up to, uh, to manage. And, uh, but all of the things that have been described are, are managing to take advantage of the, the, the change in consumer preference. This is also taking place at a time cyclically where we're in a very low commodity uh, agricultural pricing environment. So in some ways, that's created a buffer for the supply chain to, uh, to make some adjustments to deal with consumer, the, the variety of consumer preference. Um, it's an interesting question to ask if we get into it, when, when we get into a different uh, kind of raw, call it raw material pricing environment, what pressure, further pressure that will put on, uh, on the merchandising and processing companies in, in the midstream. All of this in, in industries that are in this kind of radical transformation generally leads to a lot of strategic activity uh, because the certainty of your businesses, the models they've pursued, is, uh, I don't want to say quite under attack, but, but is, uh, are facing uh, strategic questions. All of this is also taking place, as Mohammed El Arian described, in, in uh, extremely favorable financial markets. So we are seeing a huge amount of, uh, of advisory activity, uh, which we will continue to see when we're in these kinds of favorable markets. But financial markets are cyclical. And so uh, this is kind of a unique moment where transformational activity is occurring, and we expect it to continue to occur. Great. Now, okay, moving down a little bit to, to the farm side, Sterling, what kind of examples you can tell us on how producers are trying to move downstream the chain? So this, so this is relevant for the, the earlier panel as well. Um, when Steve is talking, Steve Renaclave is talking about micro uh, branding, there are opportunities for all, to go all the way back to the input provider and organize that supply chain all the way through to the, to the end user, which is the customer. Uh, this is a direction that it's going and, and will eventually Amazon even be able to organize all the way back um, into, I think Gary said yesterday, Amazon's going to own dairy and he's going to, it's going to own other things, organizing this supply channel all the way back. Right now what we're seeing also is farmers that are very struggling in terms of being able to make margins on the row crop side, uh, if this is the fourth year that most of them will make a negative margin and looking for where they can pick up some value in uh, some additional value and a lot of times they're looking down channel at what the merchandiser has been making and how do I go around that merchandiser and deliver directly to the processor at the same time the processor is looking back up the channel how do I connect directly with the farmer and and so some of the examples of farmers loading trains trying to price the components of their wheat 
uh, for example, to get uh, better prices on the both the, the um, foreign matter blend of the wheat and also protein. Yeah. Loading a train car or two and shipping it, that can have an effect. Um, in other cases, of course, uh, organic transformation where you're looking at uh, contracting for organics or contracting for other specific attributes in the, in the product um, and, and really evaluating additionally buying assets like small elevators mm -hmm. uh, where they can store grain for longer and begin to actually be in that merchandising space. So do you think farmers are now thinking more strategically, being trying to get closer to the consumer or to the end user part of the supply chain rather than being a commodity producer? Um, farmers will always be a commodity producer. That's what they do. They, they'll work on yield, they'll develop yield, but farm businesses and the enterprise is in a position where it has to figure out how to make more margins, and that's what's happening, is, is trying to become closer to that end user uh, and looking for those opportunities. And there are opportunities to help them make more margin if you're in that center channel, um, but the key drivers here are the fact that the margins are low and also precision ag agriculture is allowing for easier farming and better uh, opportunities to, to yeah. move down the channel. Yeah, yeah. And then, then also kind of like link to what Sterling is or what we are talking about. You talk also about integration and cooperation between farmers and, and, and the commercial side. What is happening on the fruits and vegetable side? Sure, sure. So in the fruit and vegetable side, uh, this trend of collaboration has been going on for a long time, driven by perishability, right? So, so really what we see today, if we take value added, for example, it's really a heightening of something that's gone on for a long time. Um, and, I, and I think about it like this. If you're in the, va the value added fruit and vegetable industry and you're actually a processor, right, you've got this capital intensive fixed capacity that you need to keep utilized, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of weather variability on the farm dictating your ability to utilize this fixed capacity can be very scary, right? That can be, that can sink everything. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing uh, in that particular industry is you're, you're seeing these, these bigger name value added type companies really being, they're doing a couple different things. One, they're over contracting sometimes, right? As far as acreage yeah. goes. So when we see yeah. uh, weather variability, uh, hurt yields, uh, they, 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 they can still utilize their, their throughput. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is them expand as far as their regional sourcing strategy is getting larger, right? If, and, it, and that of course is driven by seasonality as well, but if we have an event here or I can't get the supply I need from this particular region, perhaps I can get it uh, yeah. over from this microclimate, sometimes not too far down the yeah. road, but can be very different. So that's one example of how, okay. how that ties into the value added industry. All right, great. So let me just move to the animal protein side and a little bit what you touched on, on your uh, presentation, Don. Uh, for me, actually, it's very interesting to think that the e-commerce is really having an, imp an impact on, 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 on the animal protein sector. I mean, uh, you, you touched a little bit on that, so I would like to ask you, like, what are the major challenges that, for example, large packing plants are, you know, facing uh, giving, giving e-commerce? I think there's tremendous opportunity, and, and Paula said it very well in her comments that the, the consumer is in the driver's seat and it's all about customization or specialization that they're going to get what they want. And if, and if a conventional packer doesn't provide it for them, somebody else will. Yeah. Now, the one thing that I think is, is different on the animal protein space than certainly in Roland's model and, and even the, the model Sterling's talking about is the seasonality difference of, in that, those various primals and they don't all sell the same the same day. That's always a real problem for the small niche producer and certainly for small producers that are just trying to enter the market. And so I think instead of trying to go it alone, 
I really think that a lot of these specialty producers or small producers that are looking to enter into that broader market space would actually be better served with collaborating with a conventional processor. Mm -hmm. And if it's nothing more than a toll kill, but that major packer is in the background, if, if we're in the middle of the, the grilling season and it's we can sell ribs and strips all day long, but we're having a, a tough time getting around of those thick meats, they can help facilitate that. Where a small producer, you know, same opposite season, we can sell roast real well during the middle of the winter, but how do you, how do you match all of those, the, that seasonality demand on yeah. your own? Yeah. Yeah, Don, I, I, have, I have a question for you. So you, we've been talking about, you know, uh, uh, pr producers change their, their mind, being a little bit more strategic, or at least having that type of thinking. How is that affecting the M&A space? Well, I, I, I wanted to uh, first, Pablo, uh, take off on what Don was saying. You know, having been at this conference for, for two days, you, on some level we've spent so much time talking about growth and smaller companies and innovative companies, you'd almost imagine that the large companies in the space uh, are, have, have disappeared. Uh, the truth of the matter is, as one of my clients or our clients said to us yesterday, you know, no one ever shrunk to greatness. Uh, and, you know, that's a, Im, implicit in what uh, Don just said, which is that scale is one of the key elements that enables you to uh, have the cash flow to invest in innovation to improve your R&D, to shift your flexibility. Um, and as another one of our clients said to me, you know, all of this is all very interesting, but, you know, we're not changing all of our infrastructure based on six months of consumer trend. How do you tell the difference between a fad and something that's a trend? Uh, and so, the, you know, the overall message we're seeing and hearing from you all is that scale actually matters a lot, uh, that vertical integration is more on than off, that um, vulnerability to commodi the commodity portions of your business is something that actually now can be tolerated a little bit better as other parts of your business have gotten closer to the consumer. Um, and, and vertical integration is also has, uh, call it an on-trend benefit, which is that uh, uh, transparency back to the, the source has become probably or one of the most important consumer trends, which is to be able to identify what the source is of all the components of what we're eating. So, None of that actually changes the, in some ways, uh, the fundamentals of an industry in, in transition. Scale is important, resource is important, uh, and the ability to have the flexibility to invest so that you can position yourself for things that go from being fads to long-term trends. Uh, is, is an important element strategically. Starting, if I can add something and ask a question also with Don. So when we look at the, the, the commodity producers and we talk about scale, what's happening there is that, that your counterparty when you're working with farmers is gaining scale. And so that producer uh, with consolidation is gaining scale and, and looking for opportunities to utilize that scale down the channel. Um, as we look at this, this opportunity that exists from the financial markets, the cyclical point in the financial markets, um, do you see some sort of development where we can go all the way from, from the fork to the, to the field and, and utilizing that, leveraging that scale that's developing from <laughs> the producers. Well, you know, a term that we haven't heard much, Sterling, uh, is, uh, and we used to talk a lot about B2C and B2B. Um, and actually, if you think, take a half step back, we haven't heard, at least I haven't heard a lot about B2B, but a lot of our, a lot of our clients are fundamentally 
if you actually look at their business models and who their customers are, they're B2B. But what's happened is, is that you can't only be a B2B company anymore because the C is driving so much of what your customer uh, requires. And so uh, regardless of where you are in this chain, you have to be mindful of, of, of what, the uh, what the consumer wants to buy, including the farmers. And so, you know, obviously one of the themes that uh, Roland commented on was, uh, was the trend in, in organic fruits and veg. Well, that, that's, that's flowing all the way through this chain. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I, I don't see an elimination of kind of the core B to B companies, but I do think that their mindsets are increasingly going to be very consumer focused. Okay, so now I'd really like to, to move it to the audience, to move to our clients and, and, and hear your thoughts, your questions. I mean, we can do that. You can, you can ask your questions in English or you can ask your questions in Spanish, it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then Roland is not letting that. <laughs> Ken, you always have great questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Is the uh, acceptance or non-acceptance of genetically modified food? So, uh, two panel question. Uh, the first question is, are we seeing any change in, or trends in the acceptance of genetically modified food in Europe or lack of acceptance here in North America? And secondly, uh, what would that potentially mean for the supply chain as we go from the fork back up to the field? Okay, well, I will, I will. thanks. Yeah. For that question, Ken. Yeah, um, that's a great question. The, the answer to the question is yes, a little, and yes, a little. Um, we're seeing yeah. some some acceptance from the European side. We continue to certify Roundup Ready or glyphosate in Europe, uh, which is you know some acceptance, but there's still probably some backlash, quite a bit there. Uh, from the U.S. side, there is a lot of push to it's, it's maybe not so much an organic, because organic uh, on the commodity side is very, very difficult to organize. Um, we had a good roundtable discussion yesterday about this, and, and it, it's hard to make the case for how that would massive, massively organize in, in a very commoditized fashion. Uh, but there's probably opportunity for direct contact track relationships uh, to organize the supply chain for organics. Now, non-GMO then, seems like it's the next alternative. And there's that optionality as well, and it's gaining um, customer, um, consumer drive in the United States, uh, where we're seeing more and more states take on the, the discussion around labeling laws, uh, and it, will, it's, it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. So it's, it's something that will probably continue to grow. How much it affects the supply chain, it certainly could have some effect. Uh, but this is where we need to go back and revisit the supply chain because our supply chain, especially in corn, wheat, and soybeans, is not set up to segregate that type of, of product. Um, and, and figuring out how to do it will be a challenge going forward. Okay, now, Sterling, I also would like to ask you a question from the audience that was sent through our app, which is how do commodity producers, let's say farmers, navigate in this new brand mission purpose world? Um, just one more time for me, please, Pablo. So how do, you, how, how do commodity producers, let's say farmers, navigate in this new brand mission purpose world? Um, far this is like Don said. This is this is something that farmers have to be as aware of as everybody else, um, especially. And I think it has more direct effect with with Roland's produce than it does commodity farmers. But commodity farmers are going to have to understand this as well. And and certainly there are opportunities to price based on on product attributes that aren't being taken advantage of right now. Yeah. Uh, protein in wheat, 
has been clear this year, but there are still places where you could differentiate more on protein. Protein in soybeans uh, could eventually emerge as, as a priceable attribute. Um, GMO-free can could be looked at as an opportunity as well, but but farmers clearly do need to be aware of how to differentiate their product, especially if they want to put pressure on that middle part of the channel. Yeah. Okay. Now let's let's move back to the audience. I think there was a question somewhere here. Back there, probably. I can't, I can't, okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, very Picard. Much. Yeah. Um, oh goodness. Sorry, everybody. Uh, my question relates to kind of the approach that I've heard um, almost universally on e-commerce. And my impression is that early adopters are niche. Of course, they're niche because there's only a very small segment of the population and their tastes are going to be way overrepresented and, and brand owners need to, to supply that. But, you know, I don't think anyone thinks that producers need to be considering mainstream products to be bought online with impressive regularity. And so is that good or bad? And is that the impression that you guys have as well? Yeah, yeah I'll, t I'll take a piece of that and, and, and then my colleagues can add to it. Uh, it when I think about uh, the online grocery space and fresh produce, right, um, I guess the conventional wisdom is that, well, it works for everything, right? It works for, for shelf-stable goods, but it doesn't work for perishables. Uh, kind of makes sense when you think about it. But when you actually look at the online grocery players, like Amazon, and you see how, how the traditional retailers have responded, and you look at their offerings online, usually the first thing you see is fresh, right? It's either produce or it's animal protein. It's the perimeter items. And there's a reason for that, right? It's the same reason why that's the first thing you see when you walk into a grocery store. Those are the high margin items. That's what they want you to buy, okay? So yes, I think even in the fresh produce space and in the food and ag space in general, we do need to be paying attention to what's happening in online grocery because there's a few big differences, but here's an important one. In the online space, there's an unlimited amount of space for information. Okay? So how it impacts the farmer, right, all the way back to the farm, is that we know the consumer wants to know more about where their food comes from and how it was produced. In brick and mortar, we have an excuse. We have limited space to tell that story. In the online grocery channel, that excuse goes away. So from a producer standpoint, make sure you're ready to tell your story digitally and make sure that it's the story the consumer wants to hear. Well, it's unlimited space as long as you hold their day trader mentality and attention span. So yeah, you got open opportunity, but, but you're dirtling with a customer with limited time. Um, part of that question we're all looking at these specialty markets and, and special opportunities and small market segments, and I think we're really quick to get away from the fact that we've still got 330 million people domestically and 7 billion people to feed worldwide with the risk of go or the, the outlook of going to 9.5 billion uh, in the next 30 years. So if we all channel in on going to these small niche markets, there's still going to be a, a bulk commodity market out there that will be the overwhelming majority of the marketplace. But I, I think that the main point is that that will happen, but that that supply channel is going to change. And, and it, the commodity supply channel is changing because of the driving factors that are out there and how do you visualize what's happening and take advantage of those opportunities. Is it a logistics opportunity to try and logistically uh, handle grain from the farmer to the, to the end or, or is it something else? How do you get that organization of the supply chain as you gain, uh, as you gain uh, scale in the farmer sector and other parts of the supply channel. Yeah. So change is happening. It is, and, and one of the one of the.
questions was, is this good or bad? It isn't good or bad, it is. And we have to understand what is and then scenario yeah. plan around that. Yeah. And, and coming back to the animal protein sector and the, and, and the meat industry, so we have got a, another question from the audience that says that, will meal kits mean lower per capita consumption on animal protein because portions are, are smaller? There, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leap ahead. And, and there's a following question with asking about Costco building the broiler plant at Fremont, Nebraska, and what changes will that cause? And I'm going to combine the two because I work that Missouri River bottom at the feed yard customers a lot. And I was recently out there uh, and, and on the road with one of the, the rural bankers, and we, we were talking the whole e-commerce thing, we were talking the meal kit thing. This, this particular guy has young kids at home, they're incredibly engaged in sports and outside activities, and I was given, I had the same concern as the question of, is this gonna mean less per capita consumption? And, and the individual I'm talking about raised the point, he says, Dawn, three to four nights a week, we're at practice or a game, and if you take the frequency that my kids are eating chicken nuggets and fries or we're grabbing pizza on our way home, and if we would adapt a meal kit or a service to have food at home, we would actually be eating better. And, and I think that's a, that's a really good point that counters the, the risk of the smaller portion sizes. Now, while I'm talking that geographic area, I don't know that, that I'm able to talk so much about the changes that Costco's broiler production will have from the plant to consumer, but I can tell you the impact that that facility is already having on production in that area is because it's totally disrupting the corn basis it's totally disrupting, uh, I say disruption, but I, I'm, I know one multi-generational uh, cattle feeder specifically who has been an industry voice person uh, for championing the beef industry. He asked for a private meeting to me because he's looking at putting broiler houses in the irrigation, corners of the irrigation circles on his place to provide opportunity. So it's going, to, it's going to have a big impact on the production side. Yeah. And we have only two more minutes to go, and I, I would like to uh, ask Don Melzer, so, what are, so given, given all these consumer trends and the implications on the farm side, what, what else? How do you want to wrap this up? Well, uh, you know, I think that uh, um, really it's been an exciting um, two days, and once again, uh, you know, Rob was very pleased to have hosted all of our clients. Uh, um, I think we've covered actually most of the themes, Pablo. So in an unprecedented fashion, I'm not going to use up my time. So um, we uh, appreciate all of your participation, and thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And we, we still have a uh, David Bassett that will, will wrap it up the, the, the program. Well, thank you very much. It was great being with you. Thank, thank you.